The second postulate of quantum mechanics deals with operators. And this postulate is that for every classical mechanical observable, that is any property which you can measure, there is a corresponding linear Hermitian quantum mechanical operator. So we talked in a previous video about what operators are and specifically about what linear operators are. Uh, this part about Hermitian, I'm going to save that for a later video. I just want to get all these postulates done together, but we'll describe in detail the consequences of what something being Hermitian means. But for now, we're going to leave that alone. And just to remind ourselves about linear operators, you can say an operator is linear if it satisfies the following types of conditions. So if an operator acting on a constant times a function plus a constant times another another constant times another function if that equals <clears throat> the same thing as the constant pulled out the operator acting on the first function plus the constant pulled out times the operator acting on the second function then that would be considered a linear operator so the types of operators that satisfy this, we're going to have things like multiplication, any kind of multiplication, like multiplying by x, that's going to be good. Differentiation, also good. You can apply a DDx out here to some function, that'll also be good. Um, integrating with respect to any variable, that will be good. Things that will not be good are things like taking a square root, Square roots will not work this way. Uh, squaring the whole function will not work that way. So those are, those are no good. But these types of operators are good. <clears throat> so let's look again at some examples of what these operators are that we have now seen in action through the particle in a box. We have total energy, which is that quantity we would just symbolize by E, but the operator is the Hamiltonian operator. And there, the Hamiltonian depends on how many dimensions our problem has, but if we have a three-dimensional system, then we'd have minus h bar squared over 2m, then second partial derivative with respect to x, second partial with respect to y, second partial with respect to z, that's the kinetic energy part. And then <clears throat> you're going to multiply by the potential energy function V, and that can be a function of x, y, and z. If you're just in one dimension, then this simplifies down to minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative with respect to x, plus V, which only depends on x. OK, so that's total energy. Then we also have potential energy, just the potential part, not the kinetic part. <clears throat> and you can calculate things like average value of potential energy, and that would be the symbol V. <clears throat> and we had some operators of what the symbol V is. That would just be multiplying times the potential energy function, whether it be a function of x, y, and z, or whether that also is oh, when I keep things in consistent colors here, whether that's a function of x, y, and z. Oh, I'm messing up again. Okay, whether that's just a function of x, y, and z, or whether that's just a function of x. Either way, it just depends on what the problem is. Okay, and then the remaining part of that would be kinetic energy as we've seen. And the symbol for kinetic energy would be T for all of it. Or if you have a multidimensional problem and you wanted to say just look at the X part, you can have T of X. And that would be what we had up in the Hamiltonian, the first part, minus H bar squared over 2M del squared, where del squared is this operator here, this sum of the second partial derivative with respect to each dimension. And similarly, if you just had it in the x direction, in the x dimension, it would be minus h bar squared over 2m 
mass of the particle, second partial just with respect to x. So all just depending on what the model system is or what you're looking at. Then we have momentum, which we can either denote by a lowercase p for the total momentum in all directions, or a specific component of it, like in the x direction, p of x. <clears throat> then the operator for <clears throat> p of x specifically would just be minus i h bar, first derivative with respect to x. And in three dimensions, we got to work a little bit differently. We got to include vectors. So we have the unit vector i for the x dimension, first derivative with respect to x. <clears throat> Well, these would be partial derivatives now since we have a multi-dimensional function, multi-dimensional wave function, plus unit vector in the y direction, j, this, uh, first partial with respect to y, plus unit vector in the k direction, first partial with respect to z. And then I have to remember to add my minus i h bar to that as well, minus i h bar multiplying out that whole thing there. I'm going to separate those two there. And lastly, everybody's favorite position, because all you got to do is multiply by position. Here we've got x, or in the multidimensional case, perhaps r, to vector r for x, y, and z. <clears throat> and then, since I have plenty of space left, I can write that, as we see, the operator x is just multiplying by x, as we've seen and the operator r, analogous to the momentum, is unit vector in the x direction times x, sorry, this would be an operator r here, plus unit vector in y dimension j times y, plus unit vector in the z direction k times z. So these are some, oper these are some example about operators. These are all uh, observable quantities, they can be measured, uh, and they are all linear operators. And once we talk later about what being Hermitian means, which is just a special subset of operators, another special property on top of this besides just being linear, uh, we're going to see that these are Hermitian as well.